welcome a very familiar face from our television screens. He's an antique expert, presenter, auctioneer, known for his appearances on programmes like Bargain Hunt, Flog It, Antiques Road Trip, Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is. He's a huge cricket fan who once worked on an auction for Shane Warne. We'll hear all about that. He's a Northamptonshire supporter, poor fella, with memories of bowling <laughs> to a former BBC Sports Personality of the Year, David Steele, the oh. bank manager who went to war. It's a very good afternoon. <laughs> good Charlie afternoon, Ross. Daniel. A wonderful to be here. It's so exciting. What a shame it's raining. But it'll blow over, won't it? I think it will. I think it will. I mean, the forecast is pretty good. Firstly, on this game... Yeah. Now, you were brought up in the oh. 1950s and 60s. Oh. 200 for six. was. You were lucky to get that in a day's play, weren't you? In a day's play, yeah. Sometimes yeah, well, 180. It depends if Boycott was on particularly stodgy form or not. Um, but 2.2, 2.3 and over, well, if, if you were lucky. Actually, yes. Andy Zaltzman is here. Andy will tell us all about before, that, Before he course. goes to lunch, I think you did some research on this and the most boring two decades of cricket were the 50s and 60s. When, when, when Geoffrey was learning how to play <laughs> and then putting it into practice. And when, and when I was playing at school. Yes. Uh, yes, um, I think 15 of the slowest scoring 20 tests were played in a five-year period in the late 1950s. The six years had the highest proportion of draws. Oh. And in England, drew 34 of 47 away tests in the Good 60s. Great grinding to a halt. And oh, yet it inspired Ken you. Ken prodding away. It inspired you, though, didn't it? It inspired you. Because 1957, you go to school. Yeah. Berkham said school. Exactly. 1957. Locked away. First year of Test Match Special. Yeah, indeed. And the year, of course... At this very ground, when May and Cowdery put on... Oh, 411 would it have been? There you go. Oh! We, we, we start you off with a where few did, testers, where, you see, where, just where to Where did see. I get that from? <laughs> well, that probably took about two and a half days. Ramadan and Valentine. That's right. The bowling was super fine of Ramadan and Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that rhyme? Marvellous. Uh, so do you... I mean, were you into cricket immediately? I mean, was it I, in I 1957? Was, uh, were you there... 57, I think, was the first game I ever saw. I think I was taking it to North Hans versus Surrey. I'm pretty sure I was, because otherwise, why would I have remembered it? And Mickey Stewart took seven catches at short leg, which was the most number of catches other than by a wicketkeeper ever in an innings. And Andy will tell us, but that's probably still a record. I wonder if it, I who's reaching for that. I think it is. Andy, it's most my, number it, of catches in my first by a non-wicketkeeper in an innings. Ooh. Oh, don't, don't. I can look that up for you, Charlie. Is I it is it Mickey Stewart, 1957, seven catches for Surrey oh, against that, uh, that, North Hans? Sound familiar. I'll dig that up for you. Thank well, you very much indeed. It's in my 1958 wisdom, and he did it, indeed take seven catches. Yeah. Off Laker and Lock, I think. A bit of Eric Bedser oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah. Because obviously in those days, he used to play bat in front of Pad, didn't they? Yeah, and, and that's, of course, how Cowdery um, played Ramadan and Valentine, played him with the pads, because mm. you could then. Exactly. Not playing a shot, kick it away. <laughs> So, did you gain inspiration from that? As, as a young schoolboy cricketer at Berkhamsted, you thought, aha, here's this pad, I'm going to. It wasn't block so it. much that, Andy, it was TMS. Really? It really was. And I can remember we used to go on holiday. My mother was always sort of slightly above her station uh, in many <laughs> ways uh, and would insist that we go on holiday abroad. Ooh. So, my father, um, who had a Hillman Husky, packed my brother and myself Sorry, into, that's a into car, the back. Well, it was a car, yes. Yeah. No, we didn't go on holiday on a dog. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And we were packed into the Hillman Husky and over the Alps, down into Italy, because that's what you had to do, you know, if you want to keep up with the Jameses. And um, the first thing every night when we pitched tent, my brother, three years older than me, would climb up a tree with a wire plugged into the transistor radio because the higher you went, you could just about get a crackly bit of commentary. That would be 57, 58, 59, and probably into the 60s. And it was absolutely an integral part of any holiday. Bother the swimming and the rest of it. Mm. What's happening in the test match? So who would have been the, your commentators then? You would have had John Arlott, Rex Don Alston. Mosey. Is he, he as early as that? Probably a little uh, bit probably later. Probably a little bit later, yes. Mm. Yes, yes. But you've had Rex Alston, perhaps? Rex Alston, indeed, yeah. Arthur yeah. Gilligan, was he, was he oh, still I going I don't remember. I CB don't remember Fry. him. I suppose probably we're still going on holiday in, into the... Well, we were into the mm. 60s when I was a teenager. And then, of course, we had our lot. Um, mm. And Jonas. And Jonas was a friend of my late stepfather. 
and he very kindly took me up to the commentary box at the top of the pavilion. At Lord's? Uh, at Lord's. I mean, mm. how exciting was that? And I can remember dear old John Arlott staggering up the stairs with his four bottles of claret. <laughs> jingling, jingling in the in the, in the, in the, in the exactly. briefcase. Yeah. And you and sort that, of, you... And that was another thing that really got me into cricket, the, the atmosphere, the characters involved. The wine. The, the wine. <laughs> yes, but for you, the wine. Well, look, Andy's got the information here. <laughs> yeah, well, Mickey Stewart jointly holds the record Ooh. for most catches by a non-wicketkeeper in a first-class innings with seven. Gosh. Sorry, Northampton, 1957. Ricky oh, you've remembered that. that. Right, yes. yeah, so I must Absolutely have been there. Absolutely perfectly. Yeah. Thank yes. you, Andy. So Northampton, that was your team. It was, and I can remember the, the name. Well, of course, they had famous people. They had Tyson, uh, George Tribe, yes. left armour. So you saw, you saw Tyson. I saw Tyson. Yeah, they, interesting they action. Very quick. A little sort of sling. I mean, it was a bit Jeff Thompson-ish, really, the way it ah. came from behind. And he was very quick. Never as quick as he was in Australia, I'm sure. Not that I was there. Um, but he was quick. And, of course, Northampton, generally, the ground is not suited to quick bowling. No, it isn't really. No, it's a bit I mean, it's a sort of Panasar Swan type. Yeah, exactly, spinners. exactly. And I think well, that the, Fellow Smith, chap who used to play for South Africa. South Africa. That's right. Pom Pom, I Pom-pom. think. He was a Pom Pom Fellow Smith. Great friend of George Lambs, who's a stalwart of my Middleton Stoney Club. Uh, great, great friend of his. Um, but, yeah, the Northamptonshire side, of course, Keith Andrew, keeping wicket in the 60s, mm. who... People generally reckon was the best wicket keeper to miss out on. He was mm. understudying to Godfrey Evans. All Godfrey Evans all that time. Yeah. Yes, and then I suppose Parks would have come in. Yes, Jim bit Parks. Our, Jim, bit of uh, Murray. J.T. Murray. J.T. Murray. And Andrew just missed out a little bit. I suppose a little bit like John Simpson at Middlesex these yeah, days, who is right. of course a Lord's Taverner, which you are too. I am indeed. And you are wearing your Lord's Taverner's I, tie, I am. which which you wear pretty much to every single thing I see you on television on. Yeah. Well, I like to push the Lord's Taverners mm. out there, whether it be on Bargain Hunt or the road trip or whatever. Now, let's take you back to school. Yes. I mean, not literally, because that would be frightening and bring back yeah, yeah, I horrible, wouldn't really want horrible that. memories. No. Um, but you were in a, in a boarding school. Yes, indeed. So um, you got a chance to play a lot of cricket, a I would lot imagine. Of cricket, yeah. But also, you'd, you'd be listening to it in your dorm, would you? Absolutely. Under the radio, I can hear... Well, one of my memories is listening to Boycott and Barber, Bob Barber, with an opening partnership of 230-something. Wow, which uh, what? Down Bob, under. Bob Barber got nearly all of them, did he? Uh, I would imagine Bob <laughs> Barber got 233 of them, but <laughs> that's probably being a little rude. Uh, and I can remember that so vividly, plugged into my transistor radio under the pillow at school. And um, that, again, was a, a wonderful memory. What, what's, what was it that appealed to the young Charlie Ross? I mean, I've, it, 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 there were difficult times for cricket. It wasn't always on the TV. You're no. getting it. You're getting it via the radio. It isn't particularly exciting. And so, as a one-day game is starting in around about what 63 years out, so you'd be about 13 yeah. then. Yeah. But it's Test cricket that you are drawn to, and, I, ca- and county cricket. I right? am, and I'm probably drawn to it once we're into the 60s well into the 60s people like Ted Dexter that, that's really you know Ted Dexter's 70 he made against the Australians things like that he was hitting the ball see people talk about that innings a lot it's, it's a very strange one isn't it because yep. it's only 70 it is only yet, 70 it, 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 and yet it, it's one of the most famous scores of under 100 ever made it was just made. magical at the time I'm, sadly I wasn't there but I heard it on the radio and it was just wonderful the way he hit the ball and of course he was a majestic batsman when he hit a four, he hit a four. You know, it was yeah. just wonderful. Everything was in the right place. It was second nature to him. One of those natural bats, a bit like gave David Gow, though he was batting the other mm. way around. You know, it just looks so natural. Well, I mean, these, these characters that have inspired, I mean, for me, it was David Gower and Ian both. And yes. That little bit younger. You're inspired by Dex, and we'll come on to him in a minute, yeah. Colin Milburn. Um, oh. what, what do you make of what you're seeing here? Because there are so many. I mean, if you were... A, if you're a 10, 11 year old now, yeah. pitching up to a game of cricket, you've watched this first session, you've seen what Bairstow's done. I think he was on 13 off 64, so he scored yeah. 78 runs in his last 49 balls. It's, I, I mean, have you I seen am. the like I'm, of it? I am perplexed. Yes. I am perplexed because I suppose in the back of my mind I'm thinking, why the heck haven't we been doing this for 50 years? <laughs> And I'm not sure I can find anybody to explain that to me. No. Um, because I'm sure if you... All right, McGrath is a bit of a different kettle of fish. I, I just don't think that you could dance down the wicket to McGrath and keep smacking him around. But Bumrah's 
perhaps not as mm. good, but he's no mud with the ball. Well, Bear it's, says it's, been it's standing this still. attitude, and it must change the bowler's attitude, mustn't it? Yes. You know, it, it, if within three or four balls, Stokes comes down and smacks you back over your head for six, you probably got that in the back of your mind. Unless you are incredibly disciplined, you do perhaps slightly start altering the trajectory, and then, of course, the batsman's won. Yes. Well, I suppose, I suppose yes, it's exactly that. I mean, there'll be a kind of arms race between batter and bowler now, won't yeah, there? Yeah. You might see a bit more white ball variations coming into yeah. into the red ball game. Yeah. But, well, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's thrilling to watch. You've had the, one of the best seats in the house upstairs seeing it, watching uh, Bairstow. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable. And, and really good shots. Mm. You know, we're not talking about whacking. No, we are talking about proper cricket shots. Some of the cover driving, what have you? Which is um, which is what, what appeals to you, the, the yes. traditionalist in you, the Ted Dextery flowing loveliness. Absolutely. But Colin Milburn, talk Colin to me about Milburn. Colin Milburn because because oh. you're you are you actually you go a little bit misty eyed when I mention Colin Milburn. I cried when Colin Milburn had his car crash. I don't um, make any exceptions. I cried. I was so sad. I loved Milburn. I remember Milburn's first innings at Lords. Uh, correct me, Andy. He's not there. No, he's uh, yeah. He will correct me if I'm wrong. But I, it was against the West Indies, and a lot of people had said, that, "How can you pick an 18 stone man to play for England? He can't run between the wickets." And um, the selectors had the good sense to pick him, and he went out there. And how was he out in his first innings? How many did he make? Run out, naught. <laughs> <laughs> and people thought, oh, crumbs, they're so right. And then in the second innings, he absolutely laid into the West Indian attack. He got to 88, as I recollect. And again, somebody will phone in if I'm wrong. But I think he got to 88 facing Lance Gibbs. Mm -hmm. No mug with the ball. And he smacked a ball into the stands to go to 94. Uh, and then decided to do it again to get to his 100. But, of course, Gibbs was a bit too good for that. And he was, I think, bowled uh, for 94. And I'm sure he walked back to the pavilion with a smile on his face. And then he played off and on for England. And then he was playing for Western Australia. And again, I think I'm right in saying he got 300 in a day in a Western Australia game. I, I, I wow. think so. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, he was then summoned to the England team in Pakistan uh, because I assume somebody was injured or got an illness of some sort. They flew him in, mm. uh, this monstrous man, into that humid atmosphere there uh, and he played within two days or so and got a hundred and, I think, a hundred and thirty-six or something like that. He certainly got a hundred um, in his last, what was to prove to be his last test. Oh, and then and, the car and crash. And then and the car crash. And he did struggle on. He tried to play, played a bit of second 11 cricket. He, I think, actually played for the first 11 for a bit. But, you know, with one eye, I mean, the Nawab of Badordi, I think, had a little bit of sight in one eye. Um, Colin Milburn had none. He actually lost the eye. And you can't pick up yeah. the three dimensional side of it. And all that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was a tragedy. And the last time I ever saw Colin was uh, in the pavilion at Lord's up in the bar upstairs where he was in the corner having a beer on his own. And, you know... So, right, it's a, a sad of, tale, isn't it? It, it was a sad tale. Well, uh, you've, you've got most of these details absolutely spot on. Oh, 1966, yeah. West yeah. Indies. Yes. That was his first game. 1969, Pakistan, his last game. Yeah. A career that lasted under three years, actually. Two, Gosh. Two, two and three-quarter years. Yeah, yeah. And he was quite young when it, when it all all finished for him yes. he was 28 yeah yeah when the, when the prime climb. absolutely in his prime and another memory i have again you, you asked me about the passion was fortunately having tea at school um 1963 so it would have been 13 uh, and the housemaster came in and said there's a bit of a match going on here and allowed he brought a radio into the tea room where we were having tea and we listened to Cowdery coming out to bat with his arm in plaster. At school. At school. And he's like, oh, schools with this enlightened balls. now. Yes. Yeah. He was at the non-striker's end, wasn't he? He was at the non-striker's end, but he had a, had a bit of a net batting left-handed to see how he'd get on, um, but he didn't have to. I can't remember who was, either Alan or Shackleton were in at the end. Alan, I think it was, was yeah. It? yeah. I think so. Because it was actually, I mean, England only needed 
five or six to win as I well. I think so, it? yes. I mean, yes. This, this England team would have <laughs> would have just tried, tried to smack the last ball for six. <laughs> Shackleton right? would have had a wipe. I they think all, he would or, have done. Or Allen. Um, yeah. yeah, but the, just getting back to the to the school cricket as such, I was captain of the under-15 uh, 11, and I, th- I was obviously thought to be quite good, you know, the bowling mm. and the batting. I will read to you a little oh, bit please. from the Berkhamsteadian, which is my favourite bit. It, it's not about the prowess of Ross at all, because there wasn't much of that. Just to be clear, the, the Berkhamsteadian is your school the, the, the magazine. The school magazine. Right. Here we go. The ground fielding was satisfactory, and Ross is to be congratulated on his example in the field. The fact that the team's morale was never low is mainly due to his cheerful disposition. But you see, that's lovely. Is it? it doesn't mention anything about your playing prowess. No, played 8-1-2. Played 8-1-2, played eight, one, two, right. <laughs> drew, drew, drew the others? I mean, uh, we, did, uh, we drew two. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's like yeah. a losing record. Yes. I yes. Mean, was, it, was it a strong uh, cricket school? Did you, have, you had a, a professional we, coach? Uh, yeah, we did. We had Alf Pope. Three Pope brothers that played for Derbyshire, and one of them played for England, I believe. Um, and Alf was the most delightful man and could bowl equally well left arm and right arm in the nets, which for We a were coach, discussing that the other day. I mean, yes, for a coach, it's perfect, isn't it's it? It's absolutely wonderful, all right? Left arm round, right arm round, right arm over, coming at you. So whoever, whoever came out of bat, he could just like... He could just, and he put defense. it straight on a sixpence. Uh, wonderful, wonderful coach. And our master in charge was John Davis, whose brother was nearly killed, hit on the head, I think, playing for Glamorgan. Yes. Uh, it was a kind of famous incident because I think he technically died for a while uh, and they brought him back, obviously, um, which had a bit he of was an field, impact he was fielding, on the not, game. He was batting. fielding, no, he was fielding. Um, and that had quite an impact on the game at the time, in the shock of what can happen if you're hit by a cricket ball. But, but after that, I then, I think in my first year six, for one game, I opened the batting and was first change bowler. I was barely in the second team when I left school. So you got worse? Oh, I got considerably worse. worse. Uh, my bowling action was hopeless. Right? I bowled very, very fast, so at 15 it was fine. Um, but I bowled a bit like Malinga without his control. You know, the arm... Yes, the arm you're a pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, the arm didn't brush the ear. No, no, no. Sort of hit the umpire. Harry, Harry Slingers, you know, yes. and, and if you don't let it go at exactly the right moment, it well, it hits the side netting. Doesn't yeah, yeah, it? yeah. And I did a lot of side net hitting. And so, you're, so you basically had a career in miniature. Yes, it, uh, it, it lasted for about a year, and it got it, worse and worse. And, and it worse got worse and worse. worse. Then I lost it. I, I left when I left school. I went to Northampton Saints and played for a couple of years, and took up off spin bowling because I couldn't. Buy. And that, that, that is felt, the last refuge of the scoundrel, Charlie. Yeah. Off spin. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't last long because, needless to say, after two years, I then lost it as an off spinner. Okay. Where do you go? I don't know. At have a point. guess. Well, what have you got left? Slow left arm? No, 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 <laughs> but you no, couldn't do that. No, I couldn't do that. So you've only got leg spin to yes, go. Yes, leg spin. Leg spin. So I spent 20... Leg spin's quite hard. Well, I didn't find it hard. Well, I didn't have a googly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did you have a leg spinner? That's a occasionally yeah, when right. it hit a divot okay so <laughs> you sort of rolled it's, it's, it it's a roller right it's a roller and i played for middleton stoney for about 20 years bowling this tripe uh, <laughs> and it's surprising how many really quite good batsmen get out of they've never they've never faced anything so slow mm. and probably so bad yeah. and their eyes light up i can remember a, a dear friend richard pinio who played in oxford um asking me to play for the President's Eleven um, with a lot of minor counties players. And I thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm there for the beer, I'm there for the singing. Um, and this chap came out to bat with a helmet and all the rest of it, known as really quite a basher. And rather than give it to the opening bowler, he said, Charlie, he will never, ever have faced anything like this before. <laughs> <laughs> Take took the a, new ball. Which you took as a compliment. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Stumped third ball. Thank oh. you very much. I was taken off. I only bowled one over in that game. <laughs> And but it did the trick. Did the trick. Yeah. And then your best figures? My best figures were a complete fluke. Uh, I mean, a real fluke. I was asked to play for the MCC. Wow. By a chap called Ian Curtis, who used to be a wonderful left arm spinner for Oxfordshire and the minor counties. And Rupert, off, Rupert Evans was the off spinner. They were the, the spin twins of the day. And he said, we're playing Cokethorpe School. Would you please come and play? And I thought, well, I stand at third man and bat number 11. I suppose it's a bit above my standard, but I'll play. 
and they were about 70 for two, the school, when he tossed me the ball and said, it's your turn to bowl, Charlie. And I thought, no, 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 come on in. You know, you're a man with countless wickets. Uh, no, no, seriously. And I bowled, and they had never seen anything so bad. It was quite ridiculous. And they all committed Harry Kerr. They jumped down the wicket, was stumped, bowled. Caught a deep mid-wicket sort of thing? Seven for 11. Seven for 11? Seven for 11. After I'd taken, I think, four wickets of this tripe, their master in charge said, we've had enough of this. So, so he, it, play, he, he played? He, he came off the bench, if you like, and yeah. said, I'm fed up with these boys doing this, put his pads on, walked out there and said, for goodness sake, this is how you play it. I bowled him the usual <laughs> half volley outside the off stump, which he absolutely drilled. But extra cover was obviously a young man playing into the MCC and with a, a point to prove. Caught him about two inches off the ground. Lovely. Golden duck. Thank you very much indeed. Seven for 11. Are you a send-off kind of guy at I that point? No. No, no. no. no I'm a... I'm so frankly sorry, old oh, boy. <laughs> Awfully so deep down. Going, I've got five. I've got five with this, with this rubbish. <laughs> I know. Never played for the MCC again. Never asked. So you got... So, wow. So that means you've got an average of 1.56 oh, with God. the ball. Oh, yes. For the MCC. Yes. It's about the same with the bat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes. Uh, now that you've yeah. also... You, we, we mentioned earlier that you played... You bowled against David Steele. Yes. The, the, is it the accountant that went to war? If, for our younger <laughs> listeners, David Steele was a prematurely grey-haired man who was used to blunt the fearsome uh, services of Lillian Thompson. Yeah. Which he did to great effect. Uh, and not were, only Lillian Thompson, but the West Indies as well. Well, he was, he was Sports Personality of the Year, I think. He, he was. In he 1975. Was. His first ever test match was at Lord's, and he would, was plucked from relative obscurity. I think his county average was 32, 33, yeah. something like that. But they chose... He's your man, he's a Northamptonshire man. a Northamptonshire man. And his local butcher had sponsored him a lamb chop for every run. Is that right? It cost him a fortune. Because, of course, in that series, he must have got three or four hundred runs, I would imagine. Yeah, that's a lot of lamb chops. It is a lot of it. You need a big freezer. You, yes. And, and, and knowing David Steele, he sold them. <laughs> <laughs> he was that kind of a man. Uh, well, I'm not saying anything. Did you get him out? Uh, uh, no. He I, blocked you. I, he treated me the way he would have treated um, Muralitharan. He just kept sniffing it and tapping it. And I thought, come on, man. You know, this is a man that's played for England. You are facing the worst leg spinner in the history of the game. And all you can... And he had one wipe, went to mid-wicket, who dropped it. Oh, no. <laughs> and he and he retired, having, having got to 50. Because that could have been like a test wicket. I always think of those as a test wicket, if ever you get someone yes. in a charity game. Yes, I've never done that. Now, um, you've also, I see here... Um, played with David Tomlinson, the actor from Bedfords oh, and Broomsticks. Oh, wonderful, wonderful man. He was a typical old actor, called everybody darling. Mm-hmm. Didn't go down too well with my late stepfather, who was very much you know, army guards. Yes. You know, what? Dun, 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 Hello, right, darling. darling. <laughs> anyway, darling used to bring his team. Do you know what they were called? No. The Fellow Bucks. Ah. <laughs> the, and I've still got the sweater. I've got the sweater. I he think I good, could probably join that team. Yeah, yeah, you could. You've just got to be very careful late at night how you say it. But the yeah, fellow yeah. bucks, <laughs> the, the, the fellow bucks, wonderful cricket team. Um, and he would come along in his Rolls Royce GT4 and uh, entertain us all. And I can remember a good friend of mine going out to bat, asking him to hold his glass of port and his cigarette while he went out to bat. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and he, he wasn't made, expecting to bat too long. He made a hundred, came back, said to David Tomlinson, have you still got my port and my cigarette, <laughs> please? But the cigarette's uh, probably gone. The, <laughs> yeah, the cigarette had gone. David, um, I... <laughs> sums up the man I, I was was a bit of a raconteur in the in the um, pavilion you know I started telling a joke you know, and, and there was a tap on the shoulder and it was David Tomlinson Charlie I'll do the jokes if you don't mind old boy <laughs> check him out David Tomlinson he was a very famous actor in the and 50s of course and 60s. Miles Jupp yes a wonderful Miles Jupp has done a one man play about the life of David Tomlinson now, I just hope Miles takes it out on tour again. Because In which he I've, plays the part. He plays Thompson. the part and plays it superbly uh, and gets the character. And you learn, a, I won't tell people, but you learn a lot about David Tomlinson in this play, most of which I didn't know, having known the man. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm being given vital information about David Tomlinson. Yep. Ma- Mary Poppins, he was in. Yes. He's, he's the father. He's the father ben of Mary. And br- the father. Was he in yes. Bed, and broomsticks, as well? and broomsticks as well. Yeah. yeah. He's, so he's that chap. You'll remember him. Probably. Boeing, he- Boeing on the stage. West End mm. stage, many, many years ago. That must have been one of the first things I ever saw. Huge noise back yeah. in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, 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 it was. Now then, um, school for you. You've played your cricket yeah. there. Cricket's yeah. got worse and worse. Yes. How, as, did, how, did, did, how did the academic side go? The academic side was not good. No, uh, no. I, I shouldn't really have been an auctioneer. I was supposed to be a dentist. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. Why? I had an uncle, Uncle Mac, who had a very successful dental practice in Cavendish Square at the end of Harley Street. And my treat in the holidays was to have my teeth done. Not many people would say that. Um, That's a treat, is it? Well, it was a treat because... I mean, the would... 60s, I know the 60s were a bit dour, but, <laughs> but if, if, the highlight, if the highlight of your year is going to the dentist... Ah, <laughs> wait for it, Daniel, yeah. wait for it. After he'd done my teeth, he would take me to a wonderfully posh restaurant called The Hunting Lodge uh-huh. and fillet steak... Uh, and he thought, this is this is dentistry. And then after that, we would go to the Palm Beach Club, and I would oh, play roulette. Wow. And I'm sort of 16 at the time, and I'm thinking, dentistry is for me. <laughs> so two, two or three hours scrabbling around inside yeah. someone's mouth, and then four <laughs> and, or five hours it, in the casino. It, <laughs> absolutely. And he, w- I mean, he was that famous as a dentist. He was Churchill's dentist. He oh. was Bob Hope's dentist. Um, wow. The dentist yeah. of the celebrities. Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, and a lovely man, man I, with whom I, I got on so well. Um, so I did physics, chemistry and biology at All quite A-level. difficult, those. I would say impossible, not okay. difficult. Yeah. You know, I would have been better off with a bit of English and French, perhaps. Anyway, because Uncle Mac was so famous, I went to the London Teaching Hospital's to do my ucker forms, yes. you know, which you had to do to I get offers. Them. And um, they all offered me a place on three E's, which is the lowest grade possible. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a promising start. Three E's from the Middlesex, from UCH, from St. George's. All mm. oh, we want this man, <laughs> only because of his because uncle. Because of Uncle Matt, yes. <laughs> Got nothing to do with him at all. Um, and uh, I took these exams put it into perspective there were eight of us in the uh, in this sixth form class all of whom were doing medicine i think i was the only one doing dentistry and they were all offered two a's and a b two b's and an a three a's and i was offered three e's as you know i was the only one not to pass <laughs> <laughs> that's quite the effort <laughs> you've got three o's i got three o's yes they gave me an o pass which of course is unsatisfactory at the same time my father was going bankrupt. They, they thought, well, you can resit your A-levels, uh, but my father was going bankrupt, and so the, I'm told that the final school check bounced. So that wasn't much good, so I wasn't allowed to go back. So that's how I became an auctioneer. I joined a, a local firm, and in those days, they did everything. You know, they, they sold your house, they sold your furniture, they had a oh. cattle market. Uh, there wasn't the specialisation that there is today. But what was it that drew you to that, though? Because... I mean, Having to do something. And, and, that, and that was I think that was, was it. I, I went for two interviews. One was with a company called Associated Octel, which was uh, specialising in removing lead from petrol. Okay, not <laughs> uh, much fun. That, that didn't seem much fun. Um, I think what got me into the auctioneering <laughs> business was the man that interviewed me. He was a jolly soul mm-hmm. and made me feel, you know, called me Charlie from the outset. Uh, and I, I felt I wanted to work for that man. And so I did. And so... You, because I'm trying to think, an auctioneer needs to know quite a lot of things about a lot of things. I watch you on, on all your yeah. programmes. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm slightly obsessed, to be brutally honest, Good with, man. with Antiques Road Trip, yes. particularly. We'll get you on. I like Bargain Hunt. Yeah. Yes. Um, and th- th- the expertise of these experts yep. it always flabbergasts me. Yes. You know, Philip Serrell can immediately identify precisely where this pot's from. Yeah, Charlie Hanson can yeah. fi- finds a, a sort of tiny bit of silver and he'll tell you, oh, well, it's, it's yeah. made in 1785 yeah. in Birmingham. I mean, how do you absorb all that information? Because if you've done physics, chemistry, it, biology... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I- experience mostly. I mean, a lot of these people did a fine art degree. Right. Uh, and, and that gives you a very good grounding on periods and styles, Art Deco, Art Nouveau, George III, etc., etc. Silver's very easy because every bit of hall, every bit hallmark. of silver has a hallmark. So you, if you've got a little book, 
Right. You, you, Daniel Norcross, can date a piece of silver and tell me who made it and where it was made. If I can so recognise what so that old symbol means. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Not so easy with furniture. Um, paintings can be easy if they're signed, but is it the original signature? We mm. won't go into all that. But you talked about auctioneering in line with those uh, subjects. Learning about silver or china or um, paintings doesn't necessarily make you a good auctioneer. Okay. And we see some dreadful auctioneers in the business who are highly knowledgeable. Um, and uh, we see some people I hope to be a good auctioneer, but I'm not the most knowledgeable person in the world by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, most of these guys on the road trip, you know, they know far more than I will ever know. But being an auctioneer is different. You don't need to know about your subject. Now, a lot of people say, well, well, of course you must do. But actually, the people, if you're selling a, a, a specialist object, like a car, let's say you're selling a, a, a specialist car, the person that's buying it off you is always going to know more than you know, because that's his subject. That's what they want. Yes. Then, then that's what they want. Yeah. Don't sit up there pontificating on about a Rolls Royce or a Ferrari or whatever, because they know all that. And that's why they're there. What the auctioneer has to do, in my experience, is to form a relationship with the people that are bidding. My job is not to value it at £100. It's to make sure they bid £110 or £120. Or if it's a car, you know, a million, 1.1 million. So I'm there, I hope, to facilitate that. You, you've done the car auction, haven't you? And, and, and so I should, before I, we get on to that, just, yeah. just to remind people who are just tuning in, it's an unusual time today. It's our view from the boundary with Charlie Ross, auctioneer and TV personality. Um, and we've taken lunch early because it's grey and gloomy. There was a little bit of rain came out. Um, there are no real ground staff to speak of. So I think it, there must still be a little bit of rain in the air. We're expecting it to blow through. Lunch is currently being taken. And uh, we'll lose a little bit more time no. today. How but, is the forecast? Well, I thought it was is all it? right. It's oh, it's right. good. It's all right. I don't, I don't know when it starts to get better. Is it about one o'clock? One o'clock, fine. Oh, well, that's only seven minutes away. So that's, that's... Oh, crumbs. Right. So, so we better get Speed cracking. Speed on. Where were we? Cracking. Cars. Cars. Now, the, the, I, the reason that I, I know about this a little bit is that I had Richard Madley on a yes. program that I was on. And, um, and I was talking about you. And he said, oh, if ever you see him, you must get him to talk to you about going over to America to do these oh. car auctions. That yeah. was it. What was this all about? Well, I spent my life in Woburn trying to get, you know, £120 for a chest of drawers or okay. 30 quid for a commode. I've got a chest of drawers I need to get rid of. <laughs> or 30 <laughs> quid for a commode or whatever. Yes. Uh, and this mutual friend of mine said, there's a, a lovely man who used to head up Christie's car department um, who is starting on his own at Pebble Beach, California. Um, he needs an auctioneer. And I think you get on really well with him. Anyway... Um, he came over to England, we met up, Sally and I took him out for dinner, and I thought, what a lovely bloke, it's half my age, uh, he's going to start this sale. And he sent me an email about two weeks later saying, Charlie, I'd like you to do my auction at Pebble Beach. Uh, well, I'd never been to America, mm. and even been in New York. I'd certainly never sold anything for a dollar, okay. uh, I'd certainly never sold anything for a million, <laughs> and okay. I thought... Oh, to hell with it. Let's go for it. California, if it all goes wrong, so what? I'll have been to California. So um, I emailed back and said, love to conduct your sale. He then emailed back and said, that's fine, but how much are you going to charge me? And I thought, and I sent him an email back saying, fly me business class, put me up at a nice hotel, I will conduct your auction, and then fly me home. And when I get home, pay me what you think I'm worth. And I thought, I'm going to find out whether this chap is absolutely wonderful and charming or a complete a cat. moron, a cat. Yeah, yes. And he played me far more than I could ever have asked him. And I've been doing his auctions ever since. I bet you have. 18 <laughs> years of selling these cars. And it, you know, people say, oh, God, and you get nervous. It doesn't matter if you're selling something for five million or five quid. It's the same. They're all human beings. Mm. And actually, the people that buy the cars for these obscene amounts of money are all rather jolly. 
a very sub they like their subject and of course they like an english accent in america they do don't gee they? i love your accent which is the, the I'll, I'll give you two million more <laughs> yeah <laughs> and one of the cars made 20 million 20 million 20 million now that is what exciting. kind of a car is worth 20 million well this was a Duesenberg, which is the sort of american equivalent of the finest rolls royce ever made and this was made for clark gable they made uh. two of them one for clark oh, sorry this one was made for gary cooper they made one for gary cooper and one for clark gable and two people had to have it that's the beauty of an auction yes you know they weren't going to let go the estimate was admittedly 10 million but on they went do you feel any pressure at that point though no no i think the honest answer is no Mm -hmm. um you should be it's a it's like um you doing your job here I, I'm sure you don't feel pressure while you're talking it's because you're passionate really, about I'm, it I'm really a bit and, more and pressure when you do. play like this I tell <laughs> you because I'm not quite sure I know what I'm <laughs> but watching but that's the but, subject yeah. rather than yes. how you're describing yes. it isn't it yes and, and um, Jonathan Agnew the same you know it, it just comes out it's all so natural mm. and I think to me because I've been doing it for uh, 50 years um, auctioning is, so when you, so when you start, natural so when you started in the auction game yeah, you you're sort of let loose to do to run some auctions. You're not just, you know, watching other people and moving furniture. I, th- I think it's dangerous to watch other people actually, because I don't know whether you feel that with with your job. A little, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you try and mould yourself on somebody mm. or not? And I, my advice as an auctioneer is is not. Uh, I've seen people sitting in the back of the room while I'm conducting an auction making notes, you know, and and. and a bon mot, if it can be called a bon mot, is never the same if it's spilled yes. out by somebody else, is it? You know, a bon mot needs to be your own bon mot, whether it's bon or, or not mo. or mal. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be your own stamp on it. Don't try and be somebody else. So, so when, did, when did auctioneering start to become sexy, though? Because, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, you're doing yeah. your auctioneering. Yeah. And the only real programme on TV was... Antiques Road Show. Yes. Which was always, for my money, a, a wonderful program because, you know, someone will come in and they'll hand over this heirloom and they say, well, it's, it's something I'm, I never want to get rid of. I just wondered how yeah. much it might be worth. <laughs> yeah. Um, but obviously, I'm not going to sell it. It means way too much for me. <laughs> and then and you say, well, actually, it's worth about 50 quid. They go, oh, oh well, yeah. I mean, that's just as well. I mean, I've, oh, it's a sentimental value. Or, or you know, better still, oh, they 50, say, go, it's worth 50,000 oh. pounds and they go, is that I all? <laughs> Which happens nowadays because, of course, yeah. people have looked up their things online yes. and they have high expectations of what the item's worth. Whereas, of course, when it started, uh, and indeed when I did the Antiques Roadshow 20 years ago, it was a rather, well, it wasn't a great start of mine on the Antiques oh, Roadshow. Oh, no, what happened? Well, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say this, but I, oh. but I will. because As long as I you will. keep it clean. It's it's bordering clean. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. No. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I, the, I was, the, produ- the producers here looking I, I, absolutely I, the petrified. The producer is grinning from ear to ear, <laughs> dying to hear the story. Um, no, I went onto the road show and I was doing flog it at the time, so there was a little bit of um, lip curling. Was the man from flog it. Oh, I see. It's flog it. <laughs> flog it. Flog it. Flog it. Down, down there. there. Down there. And the road show is, road is the road. flagship, isn't it? The it's BBC. All, it's sort of porcelain and, and, and plastic. Um, yeah. When you go on to begin with, you're not generally asked to do things that nobody else wants to do, of course, because yes. they've got their own specialist subjects. The first item I ever did was a, an armada chest. Mm. Lovely, wonderful, with the most fantastic intricate locking mechanism. Mm. So we've got, unlike um, Bargain Hunt or Road Trip, you've got three cameras, three sound men, three runners, three makeup people. You get makeup on the Andy's Road Show. Oh, oh good not Lord. Not on Flog It. Oh, no, no, yes. no, no makeup on Flog It. No. Warts and all. I'm getting, anyway, I'm getting great insight. Yes. Do, yeah. so, so, lights, camera, action, yep. and there, there's about 20 people around there. And this is C. Ross's debut on the road show. Uh, and this armada chest is wheeled on uh, with a sack barrow, this nice chap. And it belongs to this delightful woman, aged, well, middle aged. Um, and I take one look at her, and Simon Shaw, who's running the program, says, Right, start, action. Madam, may I say what a magnificent chest you have? 
and that was about the end of that. Uh, <laughs> and, and the, the, the producer stopped it there and then, said, this is not Carry On Roadshow. This is the Antiques Roadshow. I did a few more, and that was it, really. Right. Yes, I, I don't see. think I quite fitted the slot. <laughs> what, was, what was the chest worth out of it? Chest? Oh, I can't possibly remember. About a thousand pounds. About a thousand pounds. About a thousand pounds, yes. But, so Antiques, Antiques Roadshow has been with us for a long time. Right? Arthur Negus was on it wasn't he way yes, back, yes. Way back well, when it, it, it started with something called going for a song oh which yeah. you'd remember going for a song with no, Agus, uh, Agus remembers it Agus remembers yeah. going for a song of course he does yes there was a little singing bird in a cage which was the start yes he's nodding like the clappers yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it it morphed into the antiques roadshow and then of course these other programs well that's what i was going to ask because then we start getting all the daytime stuff that i particularly love yes because you can imagine as a cricket commentator winter it's a fair bit of downtime yep you know, there's only so much hard-hitting, gritty drama you can watch on Netflix at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So You want a bit of bargain hunt. I want a bit of bargain hunt, which I, I tend, I have to say, to be, uh, to, I tend to fiddle with my phone until we get to the last 20 minutes. I'm sort of more interested with the valuing and the, and the, the sport side of it. I'm sorry. What about the visit? You know, well, we the, go to the most like wonderful places. We go to yeah. museums and cricket grounds. I'm sorry, you, you, that's upset you, hasn't it? it I do. Has. I do like Considerably. the Considerably. We like finished this interview now. <laughs> I do like the visits. I like the visits. Yeah. Um, but then road trips come along. Bargain hunt and then yeah. road trip. And there's a sort of military antique industrial complex going on now yeah. with varying different types of, of sort of... Yeah. Um, how has this happened? Because it's the cast of characters, I think, that appeals to people. It's like people like you, Charlie Hanson, Christina. Think the, yeah, I think the characters are hugely important the other thing about the road trip as opposed to bargain hunt is that it is simply not scripted at all you sit in the car goodbye off you go and a lot of people think well you know where you're going shopping you know what you're going to buy we don't you really? know, the first time quite often the first time you go in the front door of that shop it's the first time you've been to that shop you don't know the person behind uh, the counter you don't know what you're going to see and you really are on your own and so that's really very exciting people say well hang on they'll give you a good deal well of course they'll give you a good deal because they are on television aren't they yes and wouldn't you give me a good deal i'm sure you would so mm -hmm. i think there's that um there are so many mixes in the road trip aren't there there's the car yes there's the wonderful scenery usually yes. There is the auction. There's the jeopardy. What you don't get on the Antiques Roadshow, of course, is the jeopardy at the end. Exactly. I like that but bit. Because with respect, the valuer could say what he likes. And as is being a bit rude here, they mm. don't say what they like. But you can say something's worth £1,500. Where's the proof positive that it's worth £1,500? It isn't worth £1,500 until you brought until the gavel possible. down. And then it sold for £3,600. <laughs> What, what's what's, what's the, the biggest profit you've made on that? So to people at home who don't understand, people like Charlie Ross and other uh, antiques experts wander around the country, uh, pitted against each other, uh -huh. buying up items in shops and then selling them at auction. And the people uh, who make the most profit or the smallest loss yeah. win, notionally. And the uh, money that you win goes to charity. Th that's absolutely right. And you start off with a couple of hundred pounds and you try and build it through the week. Yes. Now, people ask, how long does it take? It's usually two days shopping. Then there's a gap because, of course, the items go off to yes. uh, the auctioneer so he can catalogue them, advertise them. And then you come back, say, in a couple of weeks' time, attend the auction. You've made your £200 into £360 or £28.60. Uh, and then you do two more days shopping, then a gap. and then gap. So it's actually 15 days filming for a full week's programme of seven uh, wow. three-quarter-hour programmes sometimes so taste programs. It's, it's, and there's a lot of them being made simultaneously then aren't yes they? indeed yeah because yeah there are yeah. you know well not, not not a lot but you can do two or three with a production right. company um and uh, then at the end of the day you make a profit my luck and it is luck um as, as where you're going to be and what you're going to find. I did one with the wonderful James Braxton. Yeah. And we were in Scotland. The weight test. The weight the test. Weight te Yo, you do watch the programme. I do. I really do. The weight yes. test. I is don't it? have a lot to do in is October. It? Yeah. Well, Brackers himself, of course, would pass the weight test. Yes, he um, would. Yes. But moving on. Yes. Um, he loves his cricket as well, doesn't he? He loves his cricket. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the real cricket fanatics in, in that field are Philip Serrell, of course, and mm. Richard Madley. Richard Madley. Who, yeah. just love the game and are knowledgeable about the game um going back to the biggest yeah. profit i was hoping you were going to ask this yeah. uh, we were in scotland and I, we went into a shop 
and uh, Madders said, I'll go into this room. And I said, I'll go into that. Not Madders. Um, Braxton. James Braxton. I'll go into that room. You go into this room. And on the table was a Staffordshire figure. Now, that wouldn't mean much to anybody. It was an elephant uh, with a howder, a little man sitting on top, mm-hmm. and, and a, a clock face painted onto it. And it just looked rare to me. I wouldn't pretend to think it was worth a fortune, but it just looked rare. It was badly damaged, mm. but it was priced at £12. Well, you can't thought, lose much on that. No. You? And I thought, my thinking was, obviously, if it's priced at £12, this man must have had it in a house clearance. In which case, oh, I can hear oh. them pulling the covers the off. The covers are coming off. Oh, that's, 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 that's why there's a roar. Can we get to the end of yes, this story? Yes, please, please, please. <laughs> I'm itching to know. <laughs> so, um, I thought this must have come for nothing in a house clearance. So, I um, <laughs> said to him, you had this for nothing. I'll give you two quid for it. Oh, no, you won't. <laughs> My best Scottish accent. Uh, <laughs> I, I did wonder. He said, yeah. you can have it for eight. So, I paid him eight pounds for this. Off it went to the local auctioneer in Bucky, and the auctioneer looked at it, and uh, he said, oh, Charlie, I think you've got a bit of something here. I think this could be worth a hundred or two. I thought it was worth a hundred or two, so I thought we were into a real winner in uh, road trip terms. Anyway, we had somebody on the phone from North Carolina, Mm. and several people online. And off it went. 100 pounds, 200, 300, 500, 1,000, 1,200, 1,400, 2,000, 2,000. And it made 2,700 pounds. Oh. Sold. Oh, huge excitement running around the room. James Braxton, to give him his due, stood up and said, Thank you. My road trip is now <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> and even funnier, when it came to his last object, which was a rather miserable pressed glass celery vase, which he'd paid eight pounds for. The auctioneer said, right, the celery vase, what am I bid? And James stood up and said, shall we start at 1,500? <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I think I know what you're going to say to this, but um, did, you, did you ever think, you know, you see something on the road trip and you think, what, you know, that, yeah. you, you bought that for eight pounds, you sort of yeah. 2,700. You think, I might buy that one for me yeah. and I might buy something else yeah. for the road trip. You think it all the time. Yes. But don't do it. You mustn't do that. Don't do it. Well, someone's going to see you do it. Yes. And even, of course, it's legal, but that's not really the point, is it? No. Play the game. But when, when uh, Laidlaw, that Paul yes. Laidlaw. Oh, he, he is an camera, expert and a half. Yeah. He, he bought that extraordinary camera. Yes. And one of the lovely things about it was he tried to haggle it, well, he did haggle it down from something like £20 to about £18. I, I think it was a bit more than was that. It, yeah. but, but let's say, yeah, 65, yeah, 60, whatever. 60, yeah. Below 100, yeah. Um, and it went for 16,000? I think it made 20, didn't did it? it, in the end? I'm not absolutely certain, but, but it was It was just, definitely five it's figures. It's quite yeah. the biggest profit that there's ever been made. On the but he is a consummate expert. Mm. I don't suppose he thought it was worth that much money, but really, of all the experts, mm. he knows where it's at. He's extremely, extremely he loves his militaria, doesn't he? He now, loves his militaria. Now, yeah. it's a view from the boundary. Charlie Ross with us here as the uh, covers are moving off. They haven't rolled up the covers on the side yet. No. Um, but I don't think that's far away because the skies are brightening. It's brightening, isn't it? It's brightening. We'll get back out there shortly. Um, Shane Warne, we have to talk about. Oh. Because I know the great sadness of his passing. But um, you were involved in auctioning some of his yep, stuff. Yeah, the first auction I ever did for Shane was in the Cotswolds. And I happened to, a bit of name dropping coming up here, I do apologise, but not very much. Um, Liz Hurley is quite often at charity auctions. Uh, and when she was going out with, with Shane, um, he wanted to do, they were playing cricket. A lot of the youngsters, well, they were very young then, Wade and Warner and those who are now established in the Australian side um, were playing in this charity game. And would I go and do the auction? So I did the auction. Um, and that led to one thing to another. And I ended up doing an auction for Shane Warne at Melbourne Cricket Ground Ooh. before the Melbourne Test. 2013, would that be right, you experts? Yes, I think yeah. That would. I th- uh, it feels like a game that England lost quite badly. Yeah, we lost the whole <laughs> blooming lot. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> and, but the auction was at breakfast time. What? You know, uh, Shane, was Shane Warne there? Uh, Shane Warne was there. He's not really, wasn't uh, really a uh, breakfast man. I know he wasn't a breakfast man, and neither, neither, were, neither was anybody else that was there a mm. breakfast man. And it was really hard work. Nobody really wanted a bid. I was bailed out by one Piers Morgan, oh, yes. who happened to be sitting there and felt the pain of the auctioneer and kept buying things. <laughs> so, you know, 
people talk about Piers Morgan, but in my eyes, he can do <laughs> no do wrong well, because he helped me by buying these things at the auction. And that day, you, you said... And that, 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 that very day. day, he went out to face Brett Lee in the nets. And I walked out and watched this. And Brett Lee hit him on the arm, hit him in the ribs. I, I, I think he probably cracked a couple of ribs and, in his arm. Uh, and actually, I thought Brett Lee got that wrong, personal, yeah. personally. I know it was humiliating for Piers, if you can humiliate Piers. But if he bowled him out, clean yeah, bowled six times, that would you know, that's it. Whereas, dear old Piers kept backing away to square leg and Brett kept following him following him following him and the thud was horrible yes. horrible well it's a bit a, a little bit like the absurdity of England's bowling yesterday to Jasper Boomerah who uh, 35 off and over 35 off and over I oh know He's the I number did see 10. Broad smiling <laughs> But they weren't all just but, sixes yeah. smacked, were they? They were over the slips and all over the place. There, was, there were a couple of false shots, but uh, there, were, there were a couple into the boundary. Yeah. Now, um, John Philby's message us. He'd like to, to ask you about Robin Marler's collection. Oh, yes. Great uh, scribe, player for Sussex. Yeah. Who had a, he had a famous night watcher innings, didn't he, when he got, he got six off two balls. It is hit, 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 hit the first ball for six. <laughs> Clean ball, second Sounds ball. Best Won't be doing that again. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I'd almost forgotten about that. Yes, he decided to sell his collection. He's got a lot of interesting paintings and a lot of memorabilia. And he was quite a shrewd chap, um, Robin Marler. And he thought, well, if I take it off to auction, there's going to be buyer's premium and I'm going to have to pay commission. And I'm going to. So he phoned me up and he said, what about doing it at Sussex? It can be catalogued by the Sussex mm. staff there. Um, so the cataloging is not a problem. You turn up and do the auction at Sussex Cricket Club for me. What are you going to charge me? And I thought, love for cricket. This and that. So I charged him a fraction of what an auctioneer would have charged. And actually, we had a really successful sale um, of all these things. Um, some of the paintings made unbelievable money. Really? really? Yeah, yeah. Is there, there is it, an appetite, is there, for, there, for cricket? There, there was. There, there are two or three. It's not like it was. You know, I've got a few bats signed by various people and what have you. I think if you get the moment, mm. it can really, really work. If if somebody hits a century and then you sell their bat that evening, I see. For the moment, I, yes. can, I can remember not that it's cricket related. I can remember selling um, Lawrence Delalio's shirt, something like a week after England won the World Cup. Right, and it was the moment, and yeah. it hadn't been washed, and it, it, and yes. everybody was buzzing, uh, and it made thirty thousand pounds. Wow, it was amazing. And the underbidder was a Frenchman. And I went up to him and I said, thank you very much. But why were you bidding for this? You know, what were you going to do with Lawrence? And I said, if I had bought it, I was going to burn it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to bring Andy in here at this point, because, Andy, you do buy bats, do you not? I had auction, I think. You actually go to quite a few auctions, I think. I'm right in saying. Yeah. Um, what, your your, your favourite bat, you've got an absolute <laughs> stinker of a bat. Yes, I, yep. I, I bought, a, bought a couple of uh, old bats. One from 1924, signed by the South African touring team and about 80 cricketers from the English scene, including most of the, the uh, top England players. At the time, I calculated that all the players on the bat scored over a million first-class runs between them. No! Um, it's a, yes, that, it's a, uh, that is an <laughs> astonishing statistic. Yes, Isn't and it? they range from you know Jack Hobbs and Frank Wood yeah. to some guy who'd played two games for Essex in his entire career. So it was, uh, yeah. you know, obviously the guy had taken it round various games. Um, and how much did you pay for that? Uh, well, you don't want to say. Come on, in case we're uh, this thing. Give, <laughs> I, I give a, I tell you what, give us an auctioneer's estimate. Uh, es estimate, well, I don't know, two hundred to five hundred estimate. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a snip <laughs> and uh, I've got, got one from the 1905 Old Trafford Test signed by the Australian touring team and the England team from, from that game that's quite badly not yeah. a great nick bit of woodworm woodworm but that was don't mind the woodworm it, it's, it's the fakes really isn't it and Andy you can spot them but there are so many bats out there you know signed by the wrong people well, Bradman's a classic yep. example Bradman Hammond uh, oh, hello Don yes. <laughs> let's have another I see you know uh, and so you've got to be absolutely provenance is the key it's the key with 
anything you're auctioning. Where's it been? Who owned it? And better still, if you've got photographic evidence, the, the Johnny Won't Hit Today Douglas archive that we sold. You know, it had been passed down through the family mm. and it was just in a box there. And he was a, a, a medal-winning boxer. Um, he mm. won the gold medal at the Olympic Games um, boxing, I think. Is that yes, right? Uh, I think the 1908 Games in London. I yeah. Think. Yeah. Um, more cheers you can hear because the rope's going around the outfield. Yep. And uh, we've got a start time, 1.30, which is very promising. The hover cover has not yet been moved. Do we think that that's the last of the rain for today then? So this will be a very unusual experience. You might, you're going to get to watch uninterrupted cricket. I can't wait. I really can't wait. Well, it has been it's super just a so shame far. old sticks he got out. It was a good catch, wasn't it? Very good catch. Very good catch. Now, I want, to go, I want to go back to Antiques Road Trip, yep. though. Yep. Uh, your your favourite. Because you, you, you've done some with celebrities, but you also... Yes. You, so there, oh, there are two versions. There, there, are two, two there, versions. Are, there are two that stand out. Yes. As Alan Can you imagine say. doing an antiques road trip with Honor Blackman? Oh. Oh. Yes, from the... Honor Blackman. You know, from the Avengers. And, and, well, and also... Well, and, 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 and Gold, Goldfinger. Pussy Galore. Pussy Galore, yeah. Pussy Galore. And um, Britt Eklund, the two of them. Britt Eklund and... Uh, and uh, dear old BBC, they said, would you, would you do it with Honor Blackman? Um... We've got you. I said, what car have you got us? We've got your Morris Thousand. I said, you can't put on a Blackman in a Morris Thousand. It's got to be an Aston Martin DB. That's it. Well, we're not running to an Aston Martin DB. I said, hold on. And fortunately, thanks to my American connections. Your chap. Yes. My man, um, Martin Chisholm, in the, um, in the Cotswolds, I phoned him up and said, how much would it cost to hire an Aston Martin DB5 for three days? He said, why do you ask, Charlie? I said, well, I'm going to film it with Honor Blackman. Where would you like the car? <laughs> when would you like the car? <laughs> and he delivered on a low loader an Aston Martin DB5 to the door and we drove it for three days uh, and that was that. Was that. Among I mean, the most magical three days of your life? Absolutely. I even um, Honor was fantastic. She was 86 then, sadly mm. no longer with us. But she um, was such a sport. We were filming to about 8 o'clock and I said, you're coming for dinner with us? No. Um, really am tired now and I need to get to bed and I got hold of the waiter and I said when Miss Blackman's up in her room would you send a bottle of champagne up I thought well Sean Connery can do it to Charlie Roskett <laughs> you slide dog I know but <laughs> well, that was wonderful and the other one was David Gower David Gower's been yeah. on, on Antiques Road Trip Road Trip yeah yes. how did he get on a lot of fun we drove a, a, a not an Aston Martin we drove a Ford Anglia okay <laughs> and it kept going wrong and so, Fond memories of David Gower when, pushing a Ford Anglia. When, when the cars do go wrong, I've, this is something I've always wondered because we, we get footage of, of you in the car. Yes. So, did you just get in the producer's car and hop off? No. I mean, generally speaking, I remember doing one with Charles Hansen where we had a Ford Corsair, which went wrong every day of the trip. Mm. Um, and we had a lot of fun. We, we, we pushed it and shoved it. Um, and at one stage, well, I wanted to get to the antique shop, so I went hitching. Right. got a lift with someone driving by um, and said, would you mind if we put a camera in the back seat? And they said, no, no, it's quite exciting. And they drove us around for the day. Oh, brilliant. Uh, I'm not sure it'd be allowed to happen nowadays, mm. but it, it, worked, it worked a treat. So what you see is what you get. It, I wouldn't say that the cars do all the mileage that you see on the map. Right. But a, a vast majority of the distance is done mm. in those cars. So you've got to learn how to drive these old bangers. Yes, yeah, so, and it's different, is it? Yeah, it is a bit, and you don't want yeah, to be in like, one with Charles, uh, Charles Hansen driving. No, I've no. seen that. He's, yeah. He doesn't tend to look at the road. He doesn't look at anything, really. No, no. he's buzzing around he's all over the place. arms flying. He is. How he side. hasn't read... Well, when James Braxton uses his own MG on the programme, Charles Hansen is not allowed to drive is it. it? <laughs> <laughs> now, what we haven't talked about yeah. is uh, Bargain Hunt. Because no. Now, Bargain Hunt used to be compared by David Dickinson, didn't it? Then it was Tim Wanacott. Uh, Tim Wanacott for a, a long, long, long time. time. That's right. And now there's a slightly more... Revolving cast of characters, you and Christina. Four, four of us for five, six years now, and now they've extended that to seven. 
So there's seven different people presenting it. Right. So my hours have gone down. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> but you, you've, you've been involved in something. You've been involved in a bit of controversy, though, haven't you? The controversial bargain hunt. Oh, Jarvis it was a Cocker. It was a celebrity Jarvis bargain. Cocker and Bez from the Happy Mondays. I oh, mean, yes. Unfortunately, I didn't know who Bez was or the Happy Mondays, being an no. old, old no. what's it. Um, but yes, what you're not allowed to do is obviously get Granny or your friends along to come and sit in the back and bid up your lots. No, that would be wrong, wouldn't it? Yeah, that, be, that might be considered cheating. It was cheating. It is cheating. <laughs> uh, and somebody very cleverly spotted that Bez's girlfriend, when it push came to shove, was sitting in the back there bidding up their items. Oh, that was Bez's girlfriend. That was Bez's girlfriend. Well, I mean, that's ridiculous. You'd it's, think it, at, it, least, at least get your next door neighbour or something. Thank God somebody spotted it. So um, the wonderful uh, producer, um, Paul Tucker, came, we thought, it's all going to have to go in, in the bin. You know, we've wasted a whole programme, which is horribly expensive. Um, we're wasting a whole programme here. Uh, what can we do? He said, ah, well, get them along for the final bit where you hand over the money and what have you. Get Charlie to read out the, the rule book. We made up a rule book. And I said, <laughs> thou shalt <laughs> not have anybody you know or friends to bid for these items. Uh, and look at this footage. And there is his girlfriend bidding away. So you are disqualified. Now, the fact is, he'd made eight pounds profit. Um, Jarvis Cocker had lost about 140 quid or something because he bought right. this disgusting Russian painting with nude bottoms on it and things, which was... I think really, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. You wouldn't yeah. forget that. I'll yeah. tell you, if you'd seen it in the flesh, literally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway... Um, so we said, right, Beth, I'm sorry, but you've got to pay your eight pounds back. So he had to dip into his own pocket and pay his eight pounds. And the winner was Jarvis Cocker. Um, and actually, it became from a disaster really quite well known because it's been on Gogglebox and all sorts of things, the, the episode. Well, but he's, very, he's a very characterful man, is old Bez. Yes. I don't, I don't know Jarvis Cocker, although he, he was... Nice he, man. He seemed lovely. Really he, nice man. He was living next door to a friend of mine up in Edale, in yep. Derbyshire yeah and we had a very long trip to get to Derbyshire and I didn't realise that he was living there and um, uh, famously Pulp made a song Common People Are yes that's, that, yes. that's their famous song isn't it yes well I mean my favourite version of Common People is really spoken by William Shatner right you want to live with common people <laughs> um, and, uh, sounds it's a, like a Peter Sellers number well it is a bit yeah it is a bit and, and we'd arrived after a long journey it took about five hours to get there because of trouble, trouble on the M1 and in order to decompress I bunged on William Shatner's version of common people at yeah, top yeah. volume with the door open <laughs> and started sort of shouting it in the style of William Shatner <laughs> I only to look over the fence. There was Jarvis Cocker there, looking less than pleased. Oh, I, think he, I think he thought I was slightly <laughs> traducing his most famous song, which was a bit, a bit unfortunate. Yeah, but yeah, that's my Jarvis Cocker connection. Now then, um, we've got to we've got to let you go in about two right. minutes. In about, yeah. We're in about two minutes. So now, what I, it's my lifelong ambition. It always has been. Yes, to try to sneak on to Antiques Road Trip. We've got to get you I, on. Ideally with Ebony. Right? Not with if, Ebony, yes. If you do get me on, yes. I'm fiercely competitive. Yeah. Ebony's not in this room and she's not listening. No. Right? So. <laughs> this is... No, <laughs> how? She's not listening? No, she's not yeah, listening. Yeah. She's not listening. She's in, the, she's in another room. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm just looking around. She's nowhere near. No. How do I guarantee that I'm going to win? I think you pick the right expert. Okay. Of course, that will be picked for you. Oh. You won't get a choice. And so... Who's, uh, the, who's the best? You can't guarantee... What do you like? What's your subject? What do I like? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, like, I like cricket. I like... I like Philip I, Serrell. He's your man. Yes. Go Philip with Serrell. Serrell. But he'll make me buy a, 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 a large... An old a, plough a, or something. Yes. <laughs> that you can stick in a garden <laughs> or, or turn into a plant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But there's nothing wrong with that. And Philip no. Serrell has been known occasionally to make a profit. Okay. The person you don't want on your side is me. Oh, really? I know. I am the least competitive person in the world and I usually lose. I'm a bit of a sort of after you clause. It sounds really. to me like it will be that way around. Yeah, then, won't I think it? Cyril. And okay. I'll go with well, Ebony. I mean, we could push you into the Ebony camp. Yes, and very I, happy. I, right, okay. Thrilled. And I'll take Cyril. Yep. Right. <laughs> so just rely on the expert. Yep. 
Absolutely. What's, what's big at the moment, though? Everyone's into Japanoiserie at the moment, it seems to me. Well, that's a bit passe. Is that, is that now what, passe? What you've got to do is try and guess what's going to be popular. But, you know, I'm a brown furniture man. I like old bureaus and chest of oh, drawers yeah. and wardrobes. And, of course, I keep mm. buying those things and they're hopeless. Whereas if you've got a boxed Star Wars toy or something, <laughs> no, well, you may well giggle. Yes. A boxed Star Wars toy can be worth, you mm. know, thousands. Can it? Literally. Okay. Yeah. I wish I'd so bought them. Look for something. Well, some mobile phones are worth money. You are know, they? the most extraordinary things like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I might have a couple of them in a box somewhere. Yeah. 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 Ebony has walked in. Ebony. <laughs> yes. Ebony. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Gosh. This is terribly exciting. You're coming on the road trip I with me, heard. aren't you? I heard. I'm ready. I tell you Let's what, go. When are we going? I don't know, but with those earrings, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to go. Do you think we get any money for these? I don't, I don't know if they've got yeah, any... Yeah, we could smuggle them into a shop and then you could buy them. <laughs> that sounds like a plan. That Let's do like it. Until we've got this absolutely sorted, this is probably the last road trip I'll ever do. <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> uh, I'm, so are we going to do it as a... Like, Dan, are you involved? or what's, what's happening? Yes, Dan's game well, with that, Philip that, Serrell. We've cooked it. Well, I'd, I had rather hope Christina Trevanian, but it can be Cyril. I'll give her a ring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm worried I won't get a word in edgeways though, because I think you guys have got the energy. No, 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 the... no, no you're in it. No, no. no you're you're okay, so yeah. how does I this will work? sit in the back seat. Okay, and then you we will. It. You drive okay. a really expensive old car. I'm ready for that. Right? Yep. Charlie sits we'll next run to you. I can be the man in the flag. Yeah, yeah. With the flag yeah. at the front. You wander around some very lovely antique shops, and you know what you're like. And you know, to be fair, Ebony. Yeah. You know. One look from you, and they'll give you anything Will in the they? shop. I but we've got to drive a deal, though, don't we? We've got to, we've got to really get that deal. Oh, God, you'll, you'll deal. be a brilliant I can haggler. see, uh, yeah. Oh, look Bring at a bit of South you. London Ooh, in there. and then we'll, yeah. I can see. Yeah, all yeah. right. She's a natural how much for do we? How much yeah. do we have to work with, though? 200 pounds. Oh, is it? Well, for oh, celebrity that's a bit more one. than that. Oh, has it gone 300 now? Celebrity's gone up. Oh, yeah. celebrity. Oh, yes. I don't think you like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, name, we, name your price. price. 400, 400. I think oh, we should 400. start with a grand. Yeah. Yeah. A grand. <laughs> yeah, I might not be on the celebrity thing, but I'll take it. Okay, so let's do this. Let's make it happen. Yeah, I'm all yeah. over it. Right, right. Oh. Well, I hope, I hope the director, producer, and the rest of them are listening. <laughs> well, well, if they're, they're not listening, listen. we can very simply why just don't we take do our it own and one? send it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. my wife says, why don't we play Antiques Road Trip and just go around doing it anyway? <laughs> not it's the same. Because we can't quite afford it's it and we'll lose a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same. It's not the same. No, no. I want the car. Um, Look, the Angus, umpires are out. They are. Oh, this is so uh, exciting. Charlie, <laughs> Charlie, yes. we need to thank you so much. You have given us not only a splendid view from the boundary, but you've done an hour and four minutes of what? sterling work. Crumbs, bud. You've done an hour and four minutes of rain filler there for... <laughs> For people, you have been a, a tremendous sport. There is lunch on the house upstairs, and no. the, and the lunch at Edgebaston. It's better than bargain it, hunt. It's very, very recommendable.